Vision has been championed by many philosophers throughout history as the highest of the senses because it allows us to perceive the world clearly and to find ourselves living authentically in a particular environment. David Michael Levin's critique of visual-centric culture refers to the strong tendency of vision to capture and guess, to concretize, to solidify and rule all things. And because of its indelible place in philosophy, it extends to rationalism in keeping with the technological character of modernity. Modernism is a manifestation of rationalism, a one-sided emphasis on the visual, the conceptual, and the rational, ignoring the role played by the other senses of the body in architecture, making architecture and the city itself feel withdrawn, lonely, and outside of it. These are all signs of an unbalanced development of the perceptual system. Architecture, as a place for human beings in space and time, should have a human gear, but it is also a human exploration of self and world, inside and outside, life and death. These multiple factors require humans to use all the senses of the human body to domesticate and create meaningful spatial explorations and artworks. Hedegaard argues that visual hegemony initially creates a visual feast of prosperity, but over time, it gradually blows the wind of nothingness. The dominance of the eye over culture saw architecture as a means of self-expression, detached from all contact with the outside world and focused solely on itself. And nihilism exacerbated the separation of the senses from the spiritual world, isolating architecture from the body, making reading the richness of architecture no longer possible, and turning the world into a hidden dig but meaningless visual journey. However, we still believe that the vision is a crucial factor for the entire building. The modern history of human ar architecture can be summarized as a process of human mastery of visual theory. After our body discovered the one-point perspective, the architectural form changed quickly and firmly, extending the architectural space from one-point perspective and proportion as a main conceptual approach. And for centuries afterward, space was seen and created from single point. This cognition limits and dominates thinking for centuries. However, the old methods are no longer feasible for newly developed observation object. If a painting can only be viewed from point outside of the picture, it is just like seeing something through a window. People try a new picture reality, that is, to introduce the painting and the viewer into the painting, such as the system use a different color block variation that provide more ways of thinking about the observation. The avant-garde painting broke down the previous method of perspective and created a painting that only showed the relationship between the front and back of the object. The plan arranged in depth is a visual image in painting, but it can actually product it and create it in architecture. Here the observer can surround and pass through the object. People have been constrained by the single point of view for centuries and have life outside to a certain extent, and now they can move forward through imaginary interface. So in the new building, people talk about the transparency, such as Lee Kopsius Villa Stein, which was a direct three-dimensional representation of a flat painting. Philosophers such as Descartes and Sartre had already criticized the hegemony of senses before people become aware of the problem of visual hegemony. Descartes considered the sense of the touch to be as important as or even more reliable than vision, where Sartre was more extreme in his resistance to vision and believed in that space had replaced time in people's consciousness. Marlo Pony, on the other hand, criticized Descartes' will, emphasizing the two simultaneity and interactivity of the senses. There are many other philosophers who have shown in their own way that modern society has perpetuated most of the negative trends of region domination through techno technological means and mass image reproduction. This technology of image 
reproduction and dissemination had invited a gradual emerging of time and space into one. That is, the temporalization of space and the separation of time. The domination of the world had made all space on Earth as mass productible and ephemeral as a commodity, which was undoubtedly gradually reduced the context of our existence. The fast pace of life in modern society has made people more and more dependent on visual enjoyment. In the field of architecture, in pursuit of a striking and unforgettable visual image, has turned each architectural work into a real visual product that is detached it from the depth of existence and genuine emotion. Under the current flood of visuals, architecture had become a hastily record image of a decameron rather than an encounter between the body and the world in a context. So, as the author has discussed, is touch the most important and basic sense organ? I think so. All other senses extend out from touch, which is the equivalent to skin, and each sensory system is wrapped by its respective skin. So each sense should be a type of touch, a way of perception developed based on touch. But touch is not the most important. It should be a parallel dominant relationship with vision, and the other senses assist vision and touch for the design or observation and thinking of architecture. The author argues that with the development of modern technology, architecture has been compressed and flattened into a single image, which isolates the visual senses from the other senses. Among which, the isolation from the senses of touch makes architecture lack the intimacy and plasticity of human contact. Mario Ponti, in his own Phenomenology of Perception, also suggests a relationship between human tactile senses and the environment. He argues that the objectivity and reason interrupted the most primitive connection between humans and the world. That the way people approach truth is not necessarily the only way to logical discernment. That the world has presented itself to humans, and that the most primitive sense of touch, which humans use their bodies to perceive, is a natural way to explore truth. We agree with the two authors that the architecture should not be a purely visual product. But should include the extension of multiple fields at the same time. The role of architecture ultimately returns to its use by humans, and an architecture that is merely visually unparalleled becomes unbearable, cold, and detached after the absence of contact with humans, and eventually becomes only a design and a phenomenon for people to recall its previous function. The best example of this is the brutalism architecture of the Soviet period. The buildings of this period were built to highlight authoritarianism, and were built to be impossibly tall, with the use of concrete materials that made their appearance look very transparent and visually striking. One of the masterpieces of this period is the Palace of Ceremonies, designed by Victor Drudbenese. The grandiose form and the visually solid stone material make the building seem very detached from its surroundings. And this tactile isolation deprives the building of this intimacy with humans and architectural plasticity. The second part of the book focuses on the role that the other senses in the body brings to the way people experience the world. The author contrasts the visual dominance of architectural arts by introducing the sensory architecture and talking about the. Interplay between the senses. Architecture is essentially an extension of nature into the man-made realm, a space in which people are condensed through the sheer cooperation of sensory interaction. Architecture should therefore lead the way to be a border realm for people to experience the world. The many sensory experiences that architecture contains should enhance people's experience of being. Bernard Bernstein builds on Gothic's idea that a work of art should be 
life enhancing, meaning that when people appreciate, they experience it through the conceived perceptions. This means that when people view the work of art, they are stimulated by the idea sensation to feel the power of the work together with their senses. Other than their eyes, to be transported into their own lives, such sensations are indeed reflected in an immersive sensory experience. When we view a large number of paintings, similarly, this leads to the idea that a work of architecture should be an impressionistic synthesis. A work that presents elements that need to be perceived by multiple senses simultaneously. Architecture should not only be a flat image, but also a concrete material and spiritual presence. Architecture also serves as a limit to the border of reflection, preventing one from getting lost in through with its geometric forms. The role of shadows to weaken the sharp visual senses. The shade contrast method allows irregular lighting distribution and low intensity light to make the spatial experience comfortable, creating an atmosphere of unity and solemnity and giving more privacy. Aro makes the visual experience more three-dimensional, creating a sense of connection and unity. Hearing in architecture brings the experience of tranquility. In other words, the experience of the passage of the time. Olfaction, the sense that. Makes memories of space more permanent. The sense of smell stimulates the ability of association to energize the experience of the space. Taste, translated by sight and touch into the most intimate contact with the building. Architecture can have a multiplicity of sensory experiences. However, I think the visual and tactile senses are always at the forefront of the experience. This is the only experience of space, and cannot produce space. If pursued excessively, it may fall into formalism. People can enhance the experience of different senses inside building in different ways. But the first way people experience space is still visual and tactile. People still use vision to observe the composition of spatial elements, the experience of different material generations. Although these senses can provide a richer experience for the building and emphasize the human experience in the building, and the programmed premise of function determining form, these senses can hardly be clue to form a com. Complete and logical space, and often tend to be formalistic, or overly focus on personal romanticized sensory experience. In many cases, they tend to be formalistic or overly focus on personal romanticized sensory experience instead of thinking and logical or spatial subject. Henry Bergson writes. The objects around us reflect the actions that the body may make in response to them. Architecture, as a vehicle for the body, inherently exists to suggest human behavior, and the response of people's bodies to architecture becomes an integral part of the architectural experience, an experience that should cause collisions and confrontations with people's memory interactions. Home. Is the place where people accomplish a variety of different actions: cooking, eating, socializing, reading, storing, sleeping, and architecture induces and directs and organizes 
the occurrence of this range of actions. Thus, architectural experience also takes the form of a verb. True spatial experience originates in the series of actions that people take to enter the space. The space of architecture is the space of life, and the space of life is always beyond geometry and measurability. The authenticity of the architectural experience lies in the understanding of the architectural activity by our senses, where we are in constant dialogue with our surroundings to the point where we ourselves eventually become one with them. During the design process, architects subjectivize many elements of the architectural environment, and as these elements live in the architect's consciousness, they then create a work of architecture through the body's unconscious perception of movement, balance, and scale. When an experiencer enters the building, the architect's perception of the surroundings is communicated directly to the experiencer, and this communication can even exist across time and space. People will mimic the known structure of the building through their own bones and muscles, actually using their own scale to understand the scale of the whole building. The imitation of people's bodies creates the scale of architecture.